You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that is not your history class, with me, your exuberant host, Katie Charlwood, potato fritter lover and reader of books. Well, as you are listening to this, I am currently in Scotland on a secret project that I can't tell you about. It's super secret. Oh, we're off on a secret mission. A totally secret plot. Um, Yes, that's fun. So this is actually pre-recorded before I travel, just so that I actually get it done in time, because if I have to try and do this over there, because I'm going to be so busy, I don't know if I'm going to have the time or the option. But that's okay, cause, cause, cause I'm here right now, and uh, oh my god, I actually really cannot wait to have a potato fritter. I've been dreaming of potato fritters, like with lots of salt and vinegar. Just oh, you have no idea. I'm just like salivating at the idea of it, cause I haven't had one in so long, and like, cause they just don't do them in Ireland. Oh, just like a wee chipper. Oh, it's going to be so good. But before I get into anything else, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has been rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. You have no idea the difference it makes. Like, the business end of it from, like, that annoying side of it, it really helps boost, up, you know, the show up the charts. And it makes all the difference. And I genuinely want to thank you. No, but seriously though, I really want a potato fritter. Oh, and um, speaking of people doing awesome things, I got an item from my wish list, my Amazon wish list sent to me, and well, it's it's a book. It's a book I've wanted to read for quite a while actually, but I ha- I haven't bought any books that have not been specific to whatever I'm researching, just because funds are low. But um, but yeah, so somebody sent me a book, but they didn't leave a note. And because like normally when someone sends a gift through Amazon, there's a note and and like I want to be able to thank them. I want to say thank you for the lovely gift. You know, I just I just I just think it's so anytime anyone sends me anything, I am so full of like joy, you know, for someone to think of me and go, I'm going to get that person something, you know, it's just it's so kind And it's so lovely. I just... Oh, it is just so nice. You know? I don't know how to explain it. But anyway, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, go at your jibber-jabber and fact me. And fact you, I will. But first, got to get our source on. So, because this week, we are talking about werewolves. Yes. So, because it is the spooky month, and we started off with Vlad the Impaler... Then we had Tarar the Cannibal. So we've had a vampire and a cannibal. And now we're on to a werewolf. <gasps> so yes, the werewolf of Bedburg. So we have, as our sources, Mysterious Monsters by Daniel Farson and Angus Hall. Human Monsters, an illustrated encyclopedia of the world's most vicious murders by David Everett. Witchcraft, Lycanthropy, Drugs and Disease, an Anthropological Study of the European Witch Hunts by Homoyan Sidki. I've probably pronounced that wrong. And we also have... A True Discourse, Declaring the Damnable Life of Death of One Stub Peter, a Most Wicked Sorcerer. And that's like the original sort of translation of the tale from 1590. So let's talk about Peter Stump. Also known as Peter Stubb or Peter Stump, um, because you know way back when spelling wasn't quite um, as consistent as it is now. Like dictionaries weren't really a thing, so names sort of changed depending on um, like I don't know your mood or whatever. So um, I'm gonna call him Stump um, because that's easier for me to say. Peter Stump was born somewhere at some time because he is a farmer in Germany in the 16th century and we know sweet fuck all about the everyman in the past. So most likely he was born in or near Bedburg in Rhineland in Germany 
in what we now know as Germany. Sometime in the 1500s. All we know is that by the 1580s, he is a widower with two children. So he has two kids. One called Sybil, perhaps, a daughter. And a son that we know absolutely nothing about. We don't know his age. We don't know his name. We just know he, he existed. So at this point, Bedburg, Rhineland, all that stuff, it's part of the Holy Roman Empire. And during this time, there's like a t- there's a ton of stuff going on. There are there's a whole Protestant versus Catholic thing, and you know which never goes well, as anyone who's ever heard anything about history would know. And you know there's some ruler fighting with another ruler, and basically this area was a rural area had basically been you know in the middle of just shit consistently. It had been ravaged by the Cologne War, also known as the Sewer War, by the way, um, which we'll discuss another time. But, oh yeah, and the plague. Let's not forget the plague is happening. But stump, stub, stump. Well, actually, um, that being said, Peter Peter had a, had a stump, actually. His left hand had been lobbed off. I don't know why. I don't know how. I just know it was missing. Because we, sometimes... When you get information from the past, you only get a wee bit of it. So anyway, in the 1560s, weird shit starts happening around Bedburg. The first thing, livestock start being slaughtered. They are exsanguinated and mutilated. Basically, they are ripped to shreds and the blood is drained from them. So we're talking, so we're talking goats, sheep, cows, like just destruction everywhere and then and this was something that just kept happening for years so farmers would just go out to like their fields and shit and they would just find animals torn apart their livelihood and their livestock destroyed which is bad enough but then it wasn't just the livestock that was being ripped to shreds something started attacking the villagers mainly women and children And like, at this point in time, everyone assumed, like, werewolf fever, effectively, had spread through the countryside. Like, France and Germany especially were in the thrall of the fear of werewolves. So much so, that when somebody couldn't find their child, if their child went missing, they gave up all hope and naturally assumed that they had been taken and murdered by the werewolf. So over 20 years, kids would just disappear from farms, from their homes even. Women were often grabbed on their way home. And young women, they disappeared from paths that they walked every day. So whether they were going through the forest or a field or a pasture, that's where they would be taken from. Now, it's nice to see that nothing has changed in... It's good to see that nothing's really changed in nearly 500 years. Woo! So, content warning, this is gonna get kind of gross. Some of the women who were attacked were pregnant. Not that that helped them any. The bodies that were recovered were horrifically mutilated. And due to the severity of the attacks, that's what really led people to really grab onto the werewolf idea as opposed to it just being you know, a wolf or a pack of wolves. It had to be something greater, basically. So the townspeople were like, fuck this for a game of soldiers. We're going to get this fucking werewolf. So out they went hunting. So they would go from town to town, village to village, and they would be like, you know, armed to the fucking teeth, ready to get this wolf, which I'm going to actually quote now, was described as greedy, strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled like unto brands of fire, a mouth great and wide, with mouth sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, 
Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Much better to eat you with. Ha 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 ha. I couldn't help myself. I'm so sorry. But, so on a particular hunting day, so one day, in 1589, after years of trying to catch this wolf, a group of men with their dogs track the wolf. So the hounds have it cornered. And as the men approach, they realise it's not a wolf at all. But instead, it is wealthy farmer Peter Stumpf. So this hunting party, they are chasing this wolf down for... So depending on where you hear this story, they either saw him transform, or they were really fucking surprised to see him, or he owned a cloak made out of wolf skin that he may or may not have been wearing, but we, it's just, we don't, we don't know. We don't know. Nobody, nobody accurately wrote this shit down, so maybe, I guess. Now, the first thing that made them go, ah, this fella right here, this is the killer, because all reports of the wolf said that it had one paw, and Peter Stump had a stump. They were both missing a left hand slash paw. So he was taken in for questioning, and by questioning I mean torture, And he confessed to, at the age of 12, making a pact with the devil himself. Also, in addition, furthermore, the Prince of Lies himself provided him a magic belt in exchange for his immortal soul. And, according to Stumpf, this magic belt, which was surprisingly never recovered, whatever, uh, managed to turn him into a wolf. So not only does he confess to this... But he also confesses to a fuck ton of murders. He claims he is responsible for the deaths of at least 13 children, two pregnant women, a few more women, and animals. So if you don't like people talking about murder, uh, now I'm going to do a warning. And um, don't worry, it gets worse. Because, so if you are uncomfortable with... um discussion of horrific violent murder i'm gonna suggest you skip like 35 seconds the pregnant women that were attacked and murdered he ripped the fetuses from their wombs and ate them which he then described as tasty morsels ew and also ick the young women that weren't pregnant or that he that weren't knowingly pregnant i'm gonna say he raped them. He used the term ravaged, but I'm going to I'm going to be correct here. He raped them before he slaughtered them. With the small children, he strangled them, bludgeoned them, and ripped their throats open with his bare hands. Some of them he disemboweled. Many of them were partially eaten. He also had a really big thing for lambs and calves. Like, lambs, calves, and kids. So what he would do is, um, he would just tear them apart and eat them raw. But it's not all doom and gloom. At least one child escaped him. So, a bunch of kid- kids are out frolicking in the fields, and Stump runs after them. I'm going to assume he's in his weird wolf garb and being really terrifying. Like, it doesn't state that. But as I, logically, I'm thinking, that's kind of what he'd do. So he tries to grab this little girl by the neck. And all the other kids just flee. They get the fuck out of there. And he tries to grab her by the neck and, you know, do his throat ripping thing. But she's wearing this really high, stiff collar. And he's, like, trying to, like, get at it. But, you know, she ends up 
is doing this high-pitched scream, which makes all these cows run towards her because they think, the theory is that they think that her like wailing noises sounded like a calf in distress. So they all ran towards her. Because all the cows are running towards him. He's like, ah, no. And drops her and runs. And she manages to get away. But like she wasn't able to describe him because I don't think she was looking back, to be honest. How, what did this person look like? Like a fucking wolf? So not only did he do this, but he also confessed to having a devilish mistress as well as seducing a good Christian woman, having an incestuous relationship with both his sister and his daughter. His daughter gets pregnant and, okay, this bit's a little bit iffy because I'm not sure he may or may not have eaten his baby son-grandson. And one last thing, he confessed to luring his firstborn son into the deep, dark, shadowy parts of the wood where no one could see him, kills him, and eats his fucking brains. So, um, now, so naturally, after this big confession that he makes on the rack, which may or may not be a product of just pure torture, so, I mean, he could be innocent, I guess? Because again, we're right in the middle of werewolf fever in a country in turmoil between wars and in the middle of a religious upheaval. So he was either an incredibly vicious serial killer with um, some kind of psychological lycanthropy or he was an innocent man who was a patsy for, I don't know, animals and as an excuse to lead people back to the quote-unquote true church. So, Stubb was found guilty on October 28th, 1589. And he was executed. But how, I hear you ask, well, he was laid on a wheel. So he's spread-eagled on this thing. And red-hot pincers are used to pull the flesh off of his bones in ten spots. Why specifically 10? Why specifically 10? Whom's to say? But after that, his legs and arms are broken with like an axe. And then his head is chopped off. So his body is then burned. But Peter was not the only person to die that day. You see, his mistress, Catherine Trompin, and his daughter, Sybil, also flayed and burnt at the stake for uh, aiding and abetting, I suppose. And so ends the story of Peter Stumpf, the werewolf of Bedburg. And there's not really any reports of, like, massive deaths, you know, after his execution. But it does feel a wee bit... Now, I'm the first person to say that sometimes a creepy weirdo is in fact a creepy weirdo. But it is funny that this well-off Protestant, you know, one-handed farmer who is a wee bit weird and keeps to himself manages to be the one person who also isn't exactly young, manages to be the one person in this area, the one happens to be, you know, the villain in this predominantly Catholic area. In this predominantly Catholic and impoverished area. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Well, if you liked my telling of today's spooky story from history, feel free to rate and review five stars. Say something nice. Tell me whether you think he did it or whether he was just a scapegoat for basically politics in the church. So, what did we learn today? Well, the first thing we learned, if there's a rich man in the village, he's probably up to no good. The wars always affect the people in the dregs of society, more so than the people at the top. And what else did we learn? That no matter what century you're in, people will give you a nickname and it will stick. Okay. So, I want to say thank you to everybody for listening. And don't forget, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, 
Twitter, TikTok. Links are in the description down below. And you can also um, follow me on stuff. And let's talk about reading, watching, listening. Okay, so watching, I haven't seen it yet, but I have heard good things about the new Venom movie. Go watch it. Why not? It's fun. Reading. I am going to recommend the new book that I got. It is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. You should absolutely read this. I am, I am one chapter in and I am already engrossed. You should absolutely read this book. So for listening, for listening, I am going to recommend a podcast, actually. I'm going to recommend Wine and Crime because sometimes I like to listen to them to kind of bring my mood up. I find them really, really funny. I would absolutely listen to them. I find them really, really funny, but also they talk about crime, which I'm really into. So that's fun. So I'm going to say a big thank you and a shout out and a hello to Jerry. Jerry, who instead of a Shakespearean compliment, Jerry is one of my new supporters on Patreon and didn't want a histor- Instead of having a Shakespearean compliment or insult, they wanted me to let you all know that Percy Shelley was human trash. <gasps> uh, I had such fun saying that. Um, I do love doing shout outs, it's so much fun. But it is late. And I have packing to do. So I am going to bid you all adieu. So adios. Au revoir. Au revoir zen, my friends. Bye-bye.